In this video series, we will demonstrate the components of a rheumatology exam of the wrist and hand, beginning with a brief overview of anatomy. To begin, there are a number of important bony structures, including the radius and ulna of the forearm, eight carpal bones, five metacarpal bones, and 14 phalanges, two of which are in the thumb and three of which are in each of the four fingers. In regard to joints, there are three articulations that make up the wrist joint, the radiocarpal, ulnocarpal, and distal radial ulnar articulations, as well as many small articulations between carpal and metacarpal bones. Important joints of the fingers include a metacarpal phalangeal joint, or MCP, for each finger, as well as a proximal interphalangeal joint, or PIP, and a distal interphalangeal joint, or DIP. Important joints of the thumb include the carpometacarpal joint, or CMC, as well as an MCP joint, and an interphalangeal joint, or IP. Each joint has a synovial capsule and several ligamentous structures over top of it to, to provide stability. Important soft tissues include the finger and wrist flexor muscles and tendons anteriorly, as well as the finger and wrist extensor muscles and tendons posteriorly. Other muscles include the thumb muscles and tendons, which are located laterally and in the thenar eminence on the hand, as well as the pinky muscles and tendons, which are located medially and in the hypothenar eminence on the medial side of the hand. There are also some intrinsic muscles of the hand as well. Other important structures include the radial and ulnar arteries and the nerves of the hand and wrist, including the median nerve that runs through the carpal tunnel. With these structures in mind, we can begin our examination of the patient, starting with inspection. Inspection of the hands and wrist begins with the patient seated comfortably with their hands visible. Ensure to inspect the wrist, hand, and fingers from the palmar side, the dorsal side, as well as the radial side, and the ulnar side, and to compare between their left and right hand. Beginning with the fingernails, Observe for any signs of psoriasis, discoloration, pitting, onycholysis, or microhemorrhages. Looking at the fingers, hand, and wrist now, observe for any swelling, which can be centered around specific joints, may look like a fullness in the wrist, or sometimes a sausage-like appearance in the fingers called dactylitis. Next, look for signs of erythema, which may indicate underlying infection or inflammation. Next, we observe for signs of atrophy, which may appear as a wasting of the thenar eminence of the thumb or the hypothenar eminence of the pinky. Next, we look for any deformities. Common deformities include Hebridens and Bouchard nodes at the DIPs and PIPs respectively, as well as squaring of the CMC of the thumb, all of which may indicate osteoarthritis. Other deformities to look for include flexion contractures of the fingers, swan neck, mallet finger, and boutonniere deformities of the fingers, as well as ulnar deviation of the MCPs, all of which may indicate underlying rheumatic disease. Lastly, look for any scars or skin changes, which may indicate previous injury, surgery, or other underlying rheumatic disease. With inspection complete, we can next move on to general palpation. Start with the patient seated comfortably with their hands pronated and supported either on a table or in their lap or in your hands. Beginning at the wrist, palpate the radius and ulna and then move distally to find the joint line of the radiocarpal joint. Next, palpate over the carpal bones and extensor tendons and then onto the metacarpals and include the CMC joint of the thumb. Next, using two fingers, palpate each MCP joint. Then, using four fingers, palpate over each phalange and each PIP and DIP joint in the fingers, as well as the IP joint in the thumb. Again, looking for areas of tenderness. Next, have the patient turn their hand palm side up and palpate down the fingers onto the palm. Palpate the thenar eminence and the hypothenar eminence, and then palpate over the carpal tunnel. Lastly, palpate the flexor tendons over the wrist, as well as the radial pulse. With general palpation complete, we can next move on to range of motion. Begin with the patient seated with their hand in neutral. In most cases, approximating the patient's range of motion to normal values and comparing side to side is sufficient.
First, have the patient turn their palm towards the ceiling to test supination. Then get the patient to turn their palm towards the floor to test pronation, both of which are normally 90 degrees of motion. From there, have the patient bring the back of their hand up towards their forearm to test extension, and then bring it down in the opposite direction to test flexion, both of which are normally 70 to 80 degrees. Then have the patient turn the pinky side of their hand towards their forearm to test ulnar deviation, which is normally about 30 degrees, and then turn the thumb side of their hand towards their forearm to test radial deviation, which normally is about 15 degrees. If the patient's active range of motion is limited in any of these movements, make sure to test their passive range of motion as well. With range of motion of the wrist complete, we next move on to finger range of motion. Start by having the patient straighten their fingers while keeping them together to test extension of the MCPs, PIPs, and DIPs. A patient should normally be able to completely straighten their fingers, and often small amounts of hyperextension are also normal. Next, have the patient spread their fingers wide apart to test abduction of the MCPs, which normally is 20 degrees, and then bring them back together to test adduction at the MCPs, which normally is full closure. Next, have the patient make a fist to test flexion at the MCPs, PIPs, and DIPs. A patient should normally be able to fully close their fist, fully burying their fingernails, meaning that they have approximately 90 to 100 degrees of flexion at each of the joints. Other screening movements to test include a lumbrical grip with flexion at the MCPs and extension at the PIPs and DIPs, as well as a hook grip with extension at the MCPs and flexion at the DIPs and PIPs. If the patient's active range of motion is limited in any of these movements, make sure to test their passive range of motion as well. With finger range of motion complete, we next move on to thumb range of motion. Start by having the patient spread their thumb outwards in line with their palm to test extension of the CMC, MCP, and IP of the thumb. Normally, a patient will be able to extend their thumb completely straight and in line with the rest of the hand. Next, have the patient curl their thumb inwards adjacent to the palm to test flexion of the CMC, MCP, and IP of the thumb. Normally, a patient will be able to completely curl their thumb inwards towards the pinky side of their palm. Next, have the patient bring their thumb out perpendicular to the rest of their fingers to test abduction of the CMC, which normally is at least 60 degrees. Then have the patient tuck their thumb back towards their fingers to test adduction of the CMC, which normally will be flush with the rest of the fingers. Other screening movements of the thumb include opposition, in which the patient touches their thumb to each one of their fingers. If the patient's active range of motion is limited in any of these movements, make sure to test their passive range of motion as well. With thumb range of motion complete, we next move on to special testing. Allotment is a technique that can be used to determine if there's an effusion present in the joints of the wrist, fingers, and thumb, which may be due to many different rheumatologic conditions. Begin with the patient seated comfortably with their hand pronated and relaxed. Starting at the wrist, palpate with your thumbs the joint line between the radius and the carpal bones. With your thumbs placed beside each other either horizontally or vertically, press one thumb down and feel for the reciprocal bulge of fluid within the joint capsule with the other thumb. For the MCPs, again use your thumbs to find the joint line, and with one thumb on either side of the joint, again alternate between applying pressure and feeling for bulging. At the PIPs and DIPs, use your thumb and first finger on each hand in a pinching position to surround the joint with one set oriented vertically and the other horizontally. Again, alternate gently pinching the joint between one thumb and first finger and again feeling for the reciprocal bulge with the other. A positive test in any of the joints will yield a palpable bulge and the patient may report pain. Ensure to examine all the joints of the fingers using this ballotment technique to examine for effusions. Tuck sign can be used to determine if a patient has swelling in the extensor tendons of the hand and wrist, known as extensor tenosynovitis, which often can be caused by rheumatologic conditions. Start with the patient seated comfortably with their hand pronated and wrist in neutral with their fingers in a fist. Next, have the patient extend their fingers out straight. A positive tuck sign will yield a visible balling or shift of tissue on the extensor side of the patient's wrist with a well demarcated border distally, which may or may not be painful to the patient. This finding in combination with other history and physical exam can suggest the presence of extensor tenosynovitis.
Finkelstein's test is used to determine if a patient's wrist and hand pain is due to swelling of the tendons of the thumb near the wrist joint, known as Dequervain's tenosynovitis. Begin with the patient seated comfortably with their hand in neutral. Next, have the patient make a fist with their thumb tucked in underneath the fingers. Then with one hand supporting their wrist and the other supporting their hand and fingers, passively deviate the patient's wrist down such that their pinky approaches their forearm. This position will likely be uncomfortable in most people. However, a positive test will yield a significant and familiar pain along the radial side of the patient's forearm or thumb. This can suggest a finding of Dequervain's tenosynovitis.